know whose it is. I don't know. I don't, I don't take cream. I don't take cream. <laughs> Thanks, Amitabha. Uh, can everyone hear me OK? Is the, uh, I guess I've got it on. If I lean this way, do you still hear? OK. OK, um, I hope you guys are all enjoying this as much as I have so far. Um, you know, um, I think as scientists, we're, we're all specialists. You know, We're working on a particular problem, a particular area that totally consumes us. We get lost in the details. We usually love the details, although they can be very frustrating. But um, they do tend to make us a little bit very specialized. And um, it's a wonderful opportunity, and I'm really enjoying this already, uh, to come and think a little more broadly about topics in space uh, physics. And uh, things I've, I, I, maybe I, in my past I have spent time with, I've thought more about, uh, but um, you know, if you go to meetings, you tend to go to the areas, the sessions that focus on the things you really do, because you want to learn what's the latest in that area, or what you're doing at the moment. And so you often don't go to some, you go to some of the broader plenary talks. But to go to, uh, be able to sit through an hour and a half of, say, turbulence or dynamo theory uh, is, is wonderful for me. Um, actually, when I first read the program, I probably didn't read it very carefully, I read that I was talking about heating and acceleration of the solar wind, and I kind of panicked because I don't really work in that area. I, I'm familiar with parts of it. Um, and so I kind of dug in and uh, uh, dug into the solar wind a little bit to remind myself of um, you know, the critical points and the, the, the analysis, the Parker analysis. But um, then when I got here, I realized that um, Dana was going to be talking about that. So I was some relief, but then, of course, I. I, I had to put some other material in. So, um, but it was really fun, actually, to start to think about the solar wind again. And I, it um, actually goes back to my, um, putting this up there, it goes back to my early years as a grad student at University of Chicago. And I got there in 1966. And Gene Parker was a professor there. And um, now, 1966 was about nine years after his sort of prediction paper for the solar wind, the material that uh, Dana presented. But still, um, somehow the story of the solar wind uh, had reached mythical proportions at Chicago. You know, all of the students knew about the, um, how it had really changed the depth of what we thought about what heliophysics was all about. It, pr it provided a heliosphere that we hadn't really had before. And uh, we, of course, heard all the stories about um, how difficult it was for Parker to convince the community uh, that we didn't have a static atmosphere in the sun like all the other atmospheres we'd ever thought about. Uh, rather, we had a dynamic atmosphere that blew out as a wind. And it wasn't easily accepted by the community. And we heard about the battles between uh, various people. Um, I remember Dick Chamberlain, I think, was a strong advocate of this a solar breeze solution, maybe, uh, a subsonic uh, flow out. Um, other people simply didn't believe it. Um, after all, you have to remember that before the solar wind, people realized the sun had an influence you know, on geomagnetic activity, for example. You know, two days after a, a flare or activity on the sun, you'd see things happening at Earth. But it was thought of as this sort of solar corpuscular radiation. The very name solar corpuscular radiation sort of implies you know, things moving out as 
corpuscles, you know, and eventually hitting Earth and, and causing disturbance. Um, so it, it certainly wasn't th something that was thought to be constant and always there. It was kind of uh, only there sometimes when the sun was very active. Uh, somehow people um, overlooked the fact that comet tails always blow away from the sun. Although uh, Ludwig Biermann uh, had done studies on this and even the, and, and sort of came to the conclusion that it had to be an outflow from the sun. But somehow, you know, people and uh, people get sort of see things in a certain way that corresponds to their experience. And uh, sometimes it's very difficult to break out of that mold. And um, I think one always has to be aware of this. You know, one, one, one can get used to thinking a certain way just because it's familiar. And, um, but anyway, uh, I, I didn't get to know Gene Parker until I took his E&M class. Uh, that was um, the first, first winter. And I, I must say, it was uh, a pretty intimidating experience. I think, um, first of all, we did, this was Jackson uh, E&M, and we started on chapter six in the old green book many years ago. So what, we skipped all the first five chapters, you know. And of course, I, I, we all panicked. Uh, out of 40 students, uh, nobody got um, an A in the first, uh, in the first quarter. Um, he, I, I think some of his experience with the solar wind and trying to fight for its, ex its, its acceptance had made him perhaps a little, you know, tough. And uh, that sort of came across. He, he was convinced, I guess, from that experience that you had to really work hard. You had to be, you couldn't let anything go by without understanding it because you never know later on when you're going to have to use some circular argument or some oblique argument to make a point. And I think he, and he realized that the, that responsibility fell on your shoulders, the students. And therefore, his goal was to make sure you were responsible about the material. And he, I remember he started out with Jackson. He said, you know, you're lucky, we're lucky in this class. We have a great book. You are responsible for every word in it, every problem in it, even though I don't assign the problems. So he could be, he could be a little scary, I have to say. Um, although at that time, I think a lot of people were a little more scary than they are today. Uh, you know, it was somehow a little bit the style. <laughs> there were the, after all, Chicago, there were the four corner offices in this LASR building. Parker was in one corner. Uh, Chandra Sekar, our Nobel Prize winner for his uh, theory of white dwarfs in the uh, one corner, he was also a, not so much scary, but, you know, very hard to relate to, a very uh, a, a ethereal person, actually. Um, John Simpson, who was probably one of the greatest uh, experimental space physicists, he come from the Manhattan Project and um, nuclear physics, and he got interested in space physics. And, and I don't know how many space experiments he's been, certainly a record, I'm sure. He must have done, been involved in something like 30 or 40 space experiments. And then uh, Peter Meyer, who was uh, came from Germany and was a cosmic ray physicist. So, so there were some um, tough role models to follow. But I have to say, I, I'm incredibly thankful in my life that I had those, uh, those tough people as, as role models. And not that I ever felt I could really live up to them, but just to have be able to aim at that level, even though you would probably eventually fail. <laughs> but. Um, so uh, actually, later in his life, uh, Gene Parker became much, uh, much mellower, very open. And I think, I think he actually put on that kind of tough appearance um, to, to encourage us, to, to intimidate us to work hard. One, one habit he had was to never bring class notes to an hour and a half of E&M out of Jackson. He would always do it out of his head. And occasionally, he'd bring along a little piece of paper with him, the answer if it was a complicated expression, and just check his result at the end to make sure it was correct. So yeah, it was it was it was quite an experience. Um, I'm I'm thrilled that uh, Parker has been honored just I guess a month ago by having the solar probe named as the Parker Solar Probe. Um, certainly deserves that, and uh, he was was an, is an incredible person. Okay, there's a picture of him and some.
so or so. OK. Um, a few other issues. Uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, Dana's talk on the solar wind. Obviously, I, um, uh, you know, it was it was great to have some memories about the solar wind br brought back again. Um, actually, one of the th parts of our qualifying exam at Chicago was you had to have a paper. You had a choice of one out of, th of three papers to read, and be, uh, you know, submit yourself to questioning by the committee. This was after a written exam. And one of the papers was Parker's solar wind discovery paper. And I remember I chose that. And uh, so, so I don't really remember much of it from that time. But um, anyway, I think thinking back on the solar wind, I remember, and you know, again, this has become such a part of our existence now that we live in the domain of the solar wind. And uh, that I think maybe it's less mysterious. But at that time, it was kind of incredible. Like the, the fact that the, 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 the wind followed which demanded it go through this critical point seemed so incredible at the time. How, how would you know it had to go through the critical point? <laughs> it's a little X there. On the, well, but of course, the, the, you know, there was just, it was mysterious. And um, uh, of course, the answer to that is that the, the, the system has to relax. I mean, if you did a time-dependent code as a whole thing, it would go out there and fumble around and time evolve until it went through the critical point. That's certainly true. Um, but one thing I don't know, and Dana, maybe you know this, is um, at that point already the, Herman Bondi had worked out the, the accretion problem, essentially with the same set of equations, but taking the opposite, the line that goes through the critical point in the other direction. And I don't, I don't know whether Parker was aware of, of that solution, um, but that was done some few years, I think, ahead of Parker's solar wind paper. I don't know the answer to that. Um, anyway, one thing you didn't talk about, and I was, when I started thinking about the solar wind, thinking I, might, I would talk about it, um, is the whole issue of magnetic field and angular momentum. And um, I remember there was this great paper by uh, Weber, uh, Weber and Davis uh, in 1967 or something. And, um, you know, putting in a magnetic field into the solar wind and looking at what happens. And uh, a field which is, because as you know, as, as um, Dana mentioned, as you rotate the sun, right, the field is dragged back. Uh, particles, uh, uh, that also puts a, a torque on the particles that are leaving the sun. And um, so I'll come back to this in a sec, but yeah, in fact, What's cute about that, so I look back at Weber Davis, I said, well, maybe I could, I could work through this. Well, it was a little more intimidating than I had time for it last night. But, um, but anyway, it turns out you get an extra critical point. And so here, here at the lower, lower left is the critical point uh, Dana showed you, and is the, one you, is the Parker critical point. It turns out there's a critical point at what's called the Alfding critical point, further on that weird looking thing up there where everybody else kind of crosses. And that's the point at which the solar wind uh, flow is equal to the local alphane speed. And you can imagine that's a, a critical point, because if you have alphane waves, you know, if you're inside that, you're going slower than the alphane speed, and therefore alphane, alphane waves can, can turn around because they can go backwards either direction. Once uh, waves are swept beyond uh, that critical point, of course, the alphane waves, whatever direction they're going in, are going to get swept out by the wind. So it's obviously a, an important point. Um, the, uh, so that, that plot came from the Weber and Davis paper. The other cute, incredibly simple result out, out of um, lots of uh, you know, pages of equations um, is the fact that the angular momentum of a, of, a, of a per unit mass of solar wind flowing outwards, it carries away that amount of angular momentum, which is the rotation rate of the sun, omega, our, our alphane, the alphane critical point, squared. And uh, of course, that gives a much larger um, amount of angular momentum than um, if you just, when you leave the surface, right? At the surface, you'd have omega r sub sun squared. But it turns out the alphane critical point is usually out about, I think, 14, some, somewhere around that, 14 solar radii. So you get an extra factor of the square of something like 14. And, uh, and that means there's a huge uh, loss of angular momentum, essentially because 
the magnetic field attached to the gas in the sun is providing a, um, a torque on the sun. It's the tension is pulling the sun to try to get it to slow down. And uh, apparently, this is the uh, opposite. I don't know the details on this, but the explanation for why the sun rotates so slowly from what you would have expected. And Dana or someone else may know this. I think the argument there is, I believe, is that the Jupiter uh, has most of the angular momentum in the solar system. Uh, but you wouldn't expect that if it hadn't been for this effect. You'd expect the sun to have a substantial, a much, a much larger fraction of the total angular momentum. So the fact that the sun rotates once in 26 days, something like that, uh, is due to this effect of the, the, uh, the tugging of the magnetic field on the, on the sun. Back to the. Um, The, yeah, the, um, so the weak dependence on, yeah, let's see what, oh yeah, I remember, well, of course, the whole, the whole physics of, of why the, uh, um, the other, you know, the, the temperature falls off so slowly um, in the solar wind, that's, I'll come back to that point, but I remember that's sort of a critical issue here, that you provide enough energy out to keep the, the wind blowing outwards uh, as it goes. Um, I think one of the other things that kind of occurs to me, and I don't know how other people feel about this, is that one of the things that um, made acceptance of the solar wind difficult is that at that time, most space, and I may be off, on, off base here, but most space physicists came through, you know, didn't think, didn't have a background in fluid equations, right? In fact, I always felt disadvantaged that in, say, even at, even at Chicago, um, where you had Parker and some people. I got a little bit of fluid dynamics, but I, at, at, when I was an undergraduate, I got no fluid dynamics. As a, a, initially in the standard core curriculum at Chicago, I got no fluid dynamics. And I think part of it was that following the quantum mechanics, I mean, this is my opinion, following the quantum mechanics revolution, um, physicists saw, somehow felt that uh, fluid dynamics was kind of 19th century physics, and uh, they kind of, you know, felt that that should go into the domain of engineering. And um, I think that's true, actually. And there are many, few uh, physics departments that actually in the, in the United States which actually offer uh, really a solid uh, background in fluid dynamics. And, uh, and so some of the people I know who really made a, an, inf an influence on, on, on solar wind physics, for example, my colleague Joe Holweg went through aeronautical engineering at MIT. And so he was obviously very well versed in, uh, uh, in fluid dynamics. And the other person I think of is Ian Axford, who went through a British education. Uh, in, and of course, in Britain, um, many of the people going into space physics came through applied math programs where fluid dynamics was uh, solidly uh, featured. I don't know where Gene Parker picked up his fluid dynamics. Knowing Gene, he probably would have just learned it on the spot if it were necessary. But I have to say, fluid dynamics is a world unto itself. And you've, I'm sure you've gotten that feel from um, uh, some of the talks here. It's not easy. Um, it sometimes there's a sort of um, a complexity which is hard to understand. And I noticed a couple questions here about viscosity. What is, what is viscosity, after all? Um, you know, these enthalpies and uh, heat fluxes and, you know, you've got all these concepts that you, you sort of have to deal with or the, and the limits of incompressibility or irrotational and different approximations that you use in those cases. Um, makes fluid dynamics a bit intimidating if you haven't had much of a background in it. And uh, I wonder if just people simply couldn't imagine that the, 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 the space between the sun and the earth really was a fluid. And um, in fact, um, Parker used to harp on this issue. He used to always say, you know, after all, the collision mean free path in the solar wind, uh, one AU is something like a, an AU or more. And um, how can this be a fluid, you know? And uh, he, would, he would always try to get people to think about what localizes that gas. Of course, the magnetic field in one direction uh, but what about along the magnetic field? And then you think about, well, the fluctuations in the field, they can scatter particles back and forth and kind of replace um, collisions between particles as a way of sort of localizing properties. Um, so I think, I think that's an interesting issue here and that why 
I think people found it at first somewhat hard to uh, to think of this. And, um, and of course, the other thing Parker uh, did that um, uh, was that he, through MHD, right, he really recognized that the way to really think of of things was in terms of the beat magnetic field being prominent, and you derive the current, you know, from that curl of B, and uh, that really came up against a real resistance in the magnetospheric community, apparently, and um, from what I've heard, who, and often people in the magnetospheric community had come maybe more from an engineering background where, you know, currents and, and circuits and uh, uh, where, you know, electric fields and currents kind of control things, and to suddenly have magnetic field put at the forefront was, was uh, un, you know, was very difficult for them. And, uh, um, in fact, I remember I, I was shocked one time. that AGU had a special session on the history of the solar wind many years. I mean, this was maybe to go many years after after the, the, this was took place. But they had Chamberlain came, who had advocated the solar breeze. Parker was there. Tommy Gold was there. There was kind of a real people who had been involved at that time. And I ended up at a dinner table at, 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 and during the banquet afterwards. I ended up with. Uh, Chamberlain at the table, and somebody else, Carl McElwain from Iowa, who was a mag experimental, well-known, well-reputed um, uh, magnetospheric physicist. And we somehow were talking, and I made some comment about, you know, what an incredible progress, you know, Parker's disco uh, discovery of the uh, solar wind, or prediction of the solar wind. And he, I was amazed. He came back and said, really viscerally, he said, Parker set back the field of magnetospheric physics 20 years. And I went, huh? <laughs> so uh, you, you realize uh, <laughs> scientists can be uh, all too human, I think, sometimes. Uh, you know, I'm sure, you know, you know many, many, I think, magnetic physicists probably thought about situations like Aurora, where you have very few charge carriers, and therefore you can't sort of just cancel out. You can't have more or less you know, electric fields being sort of short, shorted out and so forth. But nevertheless, uh, I, I was shocked uh, by that comment. Anyway, so as students, it's I think it's it's great to kind of keep keep these things in mind. You know, uh, you have to you, you have to fight for your beliefs. You have to be insightful enough to really make sure you're you're right. Make sure you know what you're doing. And you have to work very hard. Uh, of course, that's the thrill of physics, and, and in general, and space physics in particular. Uh, of course, you're often lost. You know, you're often at sea on something you don't understand. And that's, but that, in the end, that also is um, probably a good thing. OK. All right. OK, there we are. You see the picture again. Um, I, um, that's you know, a kind of a schematic. Again, this is now my very brief part of this talk on heating uh, on the sort of more traditional perhaps view. I have a couple things to add, which I, I think are interesting. But the, in the, as far as the extended heating acceleration of the solar wind, it is a very complex business. And uh, Amitabha kind of indicated this. Uh, there's the turbulence. Um, there's uh, the turbulent, uh, you know, but let me, hold on, let me just go on list here. These are the things I thought about that have to do with accelerating heating processes in the solar wind. Um, it, what is known is that. The turbulent cascade somehow taking uh, fr uh, turbulence put in from the convection zone, somehow trans managing to transfer down to high enough frequencies that this fre these frequencies can interact with ions, so get down to the dissipation range, are effective. It's, I think, ion cyclotron waves, which are the higher frequency part of the alphane uh, uh, branch, uh, are effective in heating protons and ions perpendicularly. Uh, so that you get a very high perpendicular uh, temperature pe perpendicular, much greater than temperature parallel. Um, those, um, those, and then in the in the out the radial field, which is weakening, uh, those uh, those distributions can get mirrored going out, so they become more field aligned, pointing outward. So that sort of gives them a, a heave to get out, and and provide energy outwards. Um, there's, of course, the whole turbulent wave interactions are crucial to that whole process, and they continue to be crucial as you go out. 
um, you know, and and uh, you know you and I mean the details of that, as Amitav has has mentioned, are are, are can be uh, although important, not so easy to understand details. And of course, wave dissipation at the higher frequencies, which means you get sort of effectively heating of the of the ions. Generally, there's the electron heat flux, um, which is uh, a very large heat flux that goes ripping out the electrons. Uh, part of it has very high anisotropy that just you know, carries energy outwards at a huge rate. Um, that actually leads the protons and sets up a sort of an electric field, which helps pull, help pull the protons out, is my understanding. Um, magnetic reconnection, I'm sure, plays some role probably at the higher frequencies. The large scale field. You know, mostly you either have you know have a single current sheet as the field is dragged out, and then two polarities. So you don't kind of get a lot of mixing once you're out in the solar wind, except at the high at at at, at the higher frequencies where you have lots of small scale structures which can certainly undergo magnetic reconnection. Um, as a result of all this, there's some very interesting structure of the particle distribution functions, uh, protons and. Uh, uh, often have uh, and, and helium often have you know the bulk thermal sort of sort of with a somewhat usually a little bit of a t per, greater than t parallel but then as you go out um, there's uh, there's a beam forming of protons a little uh, distinct from the actual bulk thermal piece there's a, a lead little little population of protons or um, that that are that are there as well you know and the, and how that forms why that's pulled out is another part of the whole story. Um, so, um, and of course, complex spatial structures. There's flux tubes, uh, you know, um, which presumably play some kind of effect too. So, this is all this internal, you know, how how the solar wind really evolves, heated, and moves out. And I, unfortunately, um, I don't have really almost anything to add to this. I, however, I will I'll support my my ignorance by saying I was at the, the Shine meeting. Uh, last week, and there were a lot of sessions on this. Of course, not only turbulence, but uh, you know, there was a whole session on the electron distribution, for example. There was, uh, um, uh, you know, turbulence and, and and various parts of this. And I didn't detect any real consensus about how this all fits together to a unified picture. Um, so, uh, I think there are people who are knowledgeable on bits of this, but. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to inform you. However, there, there's a couple of things that are not this sort of more standard plasma, turbulence, uh, waves uh, part, which I will talk to you about. OK, there's, there's, well, there's the waves and the wind. Obviously, uh, Amitabha talked about them. Uh, but he mentioned some of the difficulties about these are obviously nice outward going waves. I think this was probably, this was way before Voyager. I think this was 1AU stuff, uh, Amitabha. Um, Oh, here's here's a picture of the electron, uh, the that's the halo part, which is isotropic. The blue blue curve and the red curves is this strahl, which is very field aligned, very narrow, and just ripping out through the solar wind, and carrying a lot of energy uh, density. Okay, and this is actually another picture you see a lot of these days. How um, if you plot, and you might probably. Uh, you plot versus beta parallel. That's the plasma beta parallel. For this is these are protons um, versus the temperature and isotropy t perp or beta perp over beta parallel, and you sort of see and you look every every piece of solar wind. You know you, you do measurements and you place them somewhere in this figure depending on what those two parameters are, and these are called Brazil plots. And they show and they almost seem to have some of a similar uh, structure to them. Um, on. This thing, unfortunately, this green laser takes a while each time you use it to heat up. Boing. Well, I don't know. I may have to give up on it. Anyway, um, and what and what causes this is that, and you see these 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 lines here. You see the the dash line above and the and the, and the one coming down this way. And these are are due to instabilities. That once, if you had a bat, uh, uh, if you were on a position in this plot, in the sort of lower right, you would tend to have a large beta parallel, and you'd you could you would excite the fire hose instability, and that would then 
you know, bring, that, bring you back into the stable region, exciting way to the process. If you're on the upper part of this, uh, you would, um, you know, you would, you would uh, excite ion cyclotron waves if you're above that line, or obviously there are some particles above it, and then you would be unstable. You would evolve and come back into the Brazil map there. And so you get some of these really interesting um, uh, conditions uh, that help you uh, see what's going on and, and show us the role of instabilities for keeping things uh, uh, in a certain domain. OK. All right. Um, OK. Uh, as far as the heating acceleration of the solar wind, or um, there are two, two issues which I think are, are sort of is, uh, interesting here. Um, and one is pickup ions. Um, OK, I don't know if you, does everyone know what uh, pickup ions are? OK, okay. it turns out, um, often when you do plasma physics, you, you, never, you never think about these. You never do pickup ions or what they are. Um, but in any space plasma, certainly, uh, you usually find yourself in, um, together with neutral particles. And actually, the, interestingly, I have spent the last several years primarily focused on neutral particles. So my plasma background is sort of, <laughs> I think, kind of uh, weakening as I go along here. And, um, and, you'd, and, and actually, what I've been working on is, because I'm a member of the IBEX team, this is a, a spacecraft that measures this neutral gas. This is the neutral gas that's relevant here, is the fact that the sun is moving through the local, a local cloud in the interstellar medium at about 26 kilometers per second. And so that cloud is about 50% ionized, depending on species. And so the neutral species simply, so this wind comes at you uh, from, from interstellar space, and the neutral particles, of course, the charged particles are swept away. They're uh, swept out by the, they can't flow through the solar wind and the gases beyond it, the charged particles. But the neutral particles just flow on in and um, some of them eventually, when they get close enough to the sun, they get ionized. And uh, actually, helium, which is harder to ionize, actually gets to within, within Earth, Earth orbit. And I've been, what I've been trying to do is, is make models of their distribution um, and to try to predict from the IBEX measurements of these neutrals what the temperature and density and velocity of this gas is out in space. You know, is it, you know, what's, what's its bulk velocity exactly? What is its temperature? And you think, yeah, what a simple problem. These are just neutral particles. It turns out all they do is go in hyperbole, right? They come on in, and they see Earth's gra uh, sun's gravity. They bend. And um, sometimes they get radiation pressure. He uh, hydrogen gets a fair amount of radiation pressure from uh, reabsorption and reemission of, of solar UV. But you say, this is trivial. How can you spend years on it? Well. You, know, you start to realize that uh, how difficult physics can be. Um, you know, the problem is when you have a distribution of um, when you have a distribution of um, uh, of particles. Okay, say Maxwellian out in space, as it comes in under forces, that distribution gets distorted, actually fairly substantially in ways you and you know I I didn't think of this for much either, and uh, and again it's because it's collisionless. And you'd think that makes the problem easier. But when something's collisionless, there's nothing that you can, can force it to be more or less, say, isotropic or something like that. And so you, uh, you and if you want a really accurate measurement, so you want to know as you slot this uh, device, this, this, um, the IBEX uh, instrument cuts through that distribution function, exactly what it will see will depend on that structure. And that's been um, you know, very, very challenging, actually. Uh, so just that simple problem. Um, but anyway, these particles come in, and um, but what happens is once they are ionized, so as long as they don't interact with the solar wind, nothing happens uh, as to the solar wind. But if they are ionized, suddenly, oh, here's, here's a picture of, of um, they come in, if, if we're over in that location, lower down here, okay, uh, you have what's called a direct trajectory, which has gone around less than an angle pi, okay. Or you have the indirect, which has come on the other side of the sun. And of course, the indirect particles come closer to the sun, and so they are more depleted by ionization, and you have the direct trajectory like that. Okay. Now, 
um, if they are ionized, so, okay, what happens is, I mean, it's a simple thing. Suppose you had a perpend, a, a solar wind going out that had this field in the azimuthal direction, okay? And actually, that after you get past one astronomical unit, you know the Parker spiral field wraps into an, a, a spiral which is nearly, has a nearly a, a perpend, uh, an azimuthal field. What happens is the particle suddenly in the frame of the solar wind has a speed equal to the solar wind, approximately, although these, these things drift in with maybe 70 kilometers per second. It's still small compared to the solar wind. So suddenly they're almost at rest. And then they're forced, because they're a charged particle now, they're forced to gyrate about the solar wind electromagnetic field and be swept out by the solar wind. So, um, so if they were truly at zero to start with, then in in that inertial frame, right, what they would start out at zero and then they gyrate. And so they would have a, a, a ring distribution around the solar wind velocity uh, with, a, with a radius equal to the solar wind speed. And then, of course, they would eventually scatter on irregularities and they'd form a shell. And then they would maybe, you know, they would, uh, the solar wind's expanding, so they would have an, an adiabatic deceleration. They would, that shell would get smaller. And um, there are these processes. Now, you might think, oh, big deal. Well, at 1A, 1AU, this is a big deal. It's a small deal, sorry, it is a small deal, not a big deal. But it turns out if you go, and I wasn't aware of this particularly, but if you go to, say, that, uh, you know, way out, let's say 70, 80 astronomical units in the solar wind, and you ask, what's the ratio of the neutral proton density to the solar wind proton density. Anyone want to guess what that is? Neutral to solar wind. Your gut reaction. Anybody? Well, I, I wouldn't have known this either. It turns out it's like 20. So if you ask where are all the masses in the outer solar wind. It's all the neutral, these neutral particles flowing in. It's not the solar wind at all. The solar wind doesn't, you know, you know, doesn't for the most part feel this, but it, but it does in fact. Okay, so it, um, it's, a major, it's a major player in this. And um, so what happens is, as these things blow out, um, there's the ring. If, if you have a, an, I've tried to draw a ring case where there's a magnetic field that's not azimuthal. Of course, when they're picked up, they have to gyrate around the magnetic field with a guiding center, uh, with a guiding center piece. Oh, there's a red one, okay. See, it, it, you know, it'll go, it'll start to rotate around the field, and also, of course, its velocity parallel to the field, the guiding center is what it is, and then it gyrates, okay. And so um, it, it, it propagates out along the magnetic field and forms this ring. Um, okay, so, it turns out these particles actually, as you can think about it, they load the solar wind. Um, and there's a very simple, you can do this in a very complex way, but I actually I went through a much more si a simpler analysis of this at some point. Um, and there's two ways um, these particles get ionized. One is by pho photoionization. If, if a photon comes along and ionizes one of them, it's simply now picked up by the solar wind. And so the... Um, and so the, on the, 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 the number density equation, okay, this is the, you know, the, from the continuity equation, steady, stationary state, okay, you have to add uh, mass in that case. And this is, the, this is sort of the rate of ionization. This has to do with the number density of neutrals here at that location where it's picked up. Uh, uh, of course, four for helium here, all right? And of course, this rate falls off as 1 over r squared, simply because the photon density, uh, which is doing the ionizers, falls off as 1 over r squared. OK, and now, but then there's a second um, process, and that's charge exchange. And the way this works is that neutral, uh, one of these neutral particles simply um, gives over its electron okay, to a solar wind proton. Okay? Uh, once that happens, the solar wind proton is neutral, and it just takes off in the same direction. It has the same velocity as the original solar wind proton. And now you've got, um, but now you've picked up, uh, um, you've picked up this new particle. So in fact, you, you, but you lost 
momentum through the original solar, solar wind that is now ripping off as a neutral particle, but you've picked up a particle nearly at rest. And so now you have simply lost the momentum of the original particle, which changed to a neutral. So you get a loss term here. And this is the uh, momentum equation. And then the energy equation, um, similarly, you lost the energy associated with, the, with that particle that was uh, ripped off as a neutral in space. And, and, and uh, so that's a loss as well Okay, on the right-hand side. And this little system of equations you can um, solve very simply. And um, what you find is you generate a pressure which only falls off like 1 over r Okay, as you go out. Actually, I did this for the case of your far enough, say, after 5 AU, where the neutral gas densities are, are constant. You actually find a pressure which falls off much more slowly than it would normally for the solar wind gas. Um, you, you find the sound speed goes up substantially. Um, okay, like R here. And then you find that the solar wind is the velocity that of the solar wind decreases by an amount proportional to R. Okay. So, and if you look at these effects at the uh, in the outer heliosphere, they're actually very, very large. You 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 slow the solar wind down by something like um, 80 to 100 kilometers per second. Um, the the sound speed goes up dramatically. And of course, what that does is it reduces the Mach number of the solar wind flow. And, um, and the pressure here can be then dominated. And in fact, it is very much dominated by the pickup ions. Okay? So the solar wind at, say, beyond 50 AU, 60 AU is very different from what we have in the inner heliosphere. And it's really controlled by these, um, uh, these particles. And it makes a big difference when we go to the the boundary regions of, of our heliosphere, what happens. OK. All right. Oh, I wanted to just point this out. Um, I mentioned to you that the pickup ions, once they're picked up, they, um, you know, they, they're picked up onto a shell. And then the shell gets smaller because of adiabatic deceleration as it moves out. But of course, at each level of the, at each le shell, you have to, that shell is, uh, was determined by the number density amount of, uh, pickup ions were, which were picked up at the appropriate radius. And so you can go through and solve this and actually find uh, what you expect for the actual distribution function of these pickup ions. And I just, I, I don't know if this exercise won, but as I go through this, these lecture, these two lectures, um, I actually submitted a few years ago a bunch of exercises which kind of um, illustrate some of these, these kind of features. And one of them, and I don't know if it's number one, I'll, I'll look up the numbers so you guys might in your spare time sometime. And all these calculations, uh, this being the first one, are kind of fun. I mean, they're not, not trivial. That, this is the answer in this case. Um, and um, if you like mathematics, mathematical physics, um, and you like to learn how to do follow some of these math uh, analytically, I'm kind of an analytical buff, to be honest. I, I hopeless at computers, I must confess. Um, in fact, I think my computer's not being backed up at the moment. So if, if there's any disaster, don't drop my computer. Um, but anyway, um, I, I love this sort of. So I've offered, uh, I think, through this lecture and the next, there's something like f uh, four problems I've highlighted from that group of problems that you might enjoy. So I'll try to coordinate that with, uh, with the program here. OK. Now, the other thing these pickup ions do is excite waves. OK, how does, how does that work? Remember, they, they form kind of a ring distribution. OK? Uh, they form a ring distribution. I'm going to have to come out here, I think, and try to describe this. Um, OK. So actually, this is, this is, not the, this is, this is the case of um, a ring that's not, not for a perpendicular field or some arbitrary angle. OK, so you have a ring out here in velocity space. Right, I'm, I'm taking a cut through it, so it comes out of the board, into the board. It's a ring like this. Okay? And um, it's our gyrating about the magnetic field, which is in this direction. Okay? Now, what happens to this? It, you, know, you know there's all these fluctuations in the wind. You've seen pictures of all these alpha A waves uh, at the right frequency. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, they, there's a strong interaction with alpha A waves either going this way or this way. Okay? So what happens? So you're going to gyrate. You, as you interact, uh, 
you're going to scatter first one way and then another. You'll do kind of a random walk on in either these waves or these waves. As, of course, as you scatter, you're always uh, having to resonate with a different frequency wave. Um, but that, that presumably, they're all present. And you see what happens. Suppose you interact with this wave. Suppose you wanted to, you just continually interact with this wave. What would happen is you'd scatter elastically in the Alfane frame, because you know in the Alfane frame there's no electric field. So you'd scatter onto this dotted circle. And you'll notice you gain a lot of energy when you do that. Okay. Well, where where'd you get where'd that energy come from? And you say, no problem, because it comes from the, the thermal plasma, which is sitting here. Well, that's not true. Uh, because it turns out the thermal plasma is essentially infinitely masses. This, this is like doing a mechanics problem and bouncing a ball off a stone wall. Uh, it picks up momentum, but no energy. And so the same thing's true for this bulk plasma here. It balances the momentum with an ever so slight little shift. But because energy is quadratic in V for this, and in the frame, if you look in the frame of the core, it doesn't pick up any energy. And so this energy to provide that energization for the particle must have come from these waves. And so rapidly, these waves are going to die. And then the only option is to scatter off these waves. When you scatter these waves, you scatter onto the dash circle. And clearly, you've lost energy, because you, you know, the, because you know, there are particles over in this part which have a small um, speed, right? And so, and in that case, um, the particles give up energy to the waves. Okay, and so you've ended up dumping a bunch of energy into the waves with which these particles are resonating. Okay, and um, actually, how are we doing on time? By the way, eleven uh, fifteen. Uh, let me just show you one more thing, and then we'll take a break. Okay. Okay. So, so you expect these part pickup ions to excite waves in the solar wind. So again, we have a turbulent wave a spectrum already in the solar wind, but here's some additional stuff. Okay. Um, all right. That shows you how to. Um, how was I going to? All that. But anyway, um, the idea is you can you can follow that evolution I talked about with what's called quasi-linear theory in plasma physics. But of course, as you dump more waves into the, um, into the, if you dump more energy from the particles into those waves, the waves then adjust how much intensity they have at the two different plus and minus, and that changes them. But you know, so so you you go through that analysis and ask, at the end when you when the particles end up on the um, on this this uh, this distribution, which is. Uh, which is called a bispherical, right? You, you end up on the, the dash on this side, and the particles over here, they lose energy by scattering on those guys. So, okay, and so uh, you end up with this piece over here, and then this inner piece here. That's where you've lost, that's sort of the optimal thing you, you scatter towards, although you may not get all the way there, depending on how much uh, intensity. Uh, how many, what the density of pickup ions is, and so forth. So the quasi-linear calculation takes care of all that, and you can calculate that. And what I so what I did this was a paper I did with um, a fellow called Wing Ip, who was uh, very much into comets, and a similar process has been observed at comets. And um, uh, so we did a calculation based on that quasi-linear theory and um, predicted. Uh, what you might see as an enhancement in the wave spectra, and they're quite substantial. Okay? Um, this is at 3 AU. Of course, at 3 AU, you don't have a lot of pickup hydrogen, because most of them are ionized already. When you get up to 7.5 AU, you get quite a bit. You actually get some huge um, uh, en enhancements here, which in the spacecraft frame are, uh, I guess, left, they're left-hand polarized, and they occur. The, en the enhancement occurs at around the cyclotron frequency, as observed. Um, so not as observed, but that's, that's um, as I, I put here. Um, a little further in, it's a little, uh, the, you know, and, and these are what I had in the solar wind power law spectra of, the, of two helicities, right and left circularly polarized. And this is the outward propagating waves, inward propagating waves. And you can see there's a substantial predicted enhancement. But let me, let me leave it at that. Let's take a little breather. And um, we'll come back to this and finish this aspect up. Okay. <laughs>
Oh, yeah, the VA service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, I know. That's a little tricky. Okay, just a sec. Okay. Okay, so these particles are a ring here. This is, that's right, this is, this is, that's right. So this is parallel and some, and some, yeah, it's a, it's a cut through the distribution. So I'm only showing you, there's also, right, it's a ring. That's correct, that's respect to the magnetic field, okay? And so the alpha wave is moving along the magnetic field. And you have a ring, or just, at, yeah, you have this, this, this ring. So, yeah, those are the, that's, that's a cut through the ring. Right, the ring is about the magnetic field. Okay, the ring is like this. It's 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 this ring when when a particle is first picked up. It it's forced because it's it picks it's at zero velocity. It's forced to gyrate around. Okay, so it goes in a circle around like this. But there are many pickup lines. I should have said this. Yeah, and many get picked up at different phases. So you end up with kind of a ring distribution. Okay. That's right, that's exactly right. And di different particles are picked up with different phases and through the ring. So you end up with a real ring distribution. Um, yeah, the radius, that's right. Uh, no, 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 uh, no, 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 the, the solar wind, no, 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 that's not true, actually. Because they, um, because they start out, right, with just in the frame of the solar wind, they start out at the solar wind velocity. At with, they start out at zero. So they immediately, they simply scatter up into the, um, about the solar wind. And so their, their radius of gyration is this velocity space. So you end up with this ring. And then the ring, right, that's right, that's right. Exactly right. That's right, right, right. Because every every one of them Only is the right, right. The yes, correct. That's correct. Absolutely correct. Yeah, that's right. So this is the so the ring is is simply here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is a cut. All right. And so the ring is here. Okay. And so now it. I'll, I'll go over again. Yeah, yeah that's a good idea. Let's do that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I know. I, I didn't. I didn't probably think about how to explain this as carefully as I should have. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, that's actually a good idea. Yes. Uh, so it's in there somewhere. So the, the one problem I showed. Yes. Okay. That's great. And and I can put the right, appropriate numbers on these yeah. appropriate exercises. Yeah. I'll just get a little bit of uh, 
the sun, either by photon ionization or charge exchange. And it is the accumulated, by accumulated the into the solar wind, yeah. And then they mass load and they yeah, yeah, and momentum and energy load. Like, uh, That's right. That's right. Being slowed down. That's right. right. It has to pick. It has to pick this stuff yeah. up, so it slows down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Because out there, the solar wind is just free flowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go. Yeah. That your mic. Oh, I know. I know. So everyone can hear me. I know. Everyone can hear me. Don't say anything nasty. <laughs> Okay, let's let's continue. I, I had a question about this, and I think I w wasn't quite as clear as I, sh I could have or should have been. Um, when these particles um, are um, picked up, okay, they, they're sitting at rest, okay, uh, so that in the solar wind frame, they are moving with the um, with the solar wind speed relative to the solar wind, okay, in some direction, okay, and so they. Um, their, but their speed, so and they're now they're scattered essentially on, around onto this ring, and the, the 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 speed anywhere on the ring, of course, is is the solar wind speed, um, and that's um, that's you know that's true here, right? I mean, this is start out here, and this distance is the solar wind speed, okay? And that's true of any species, right? Because they all have the same, they all start at rest. Um, they, you know, the, the, the angle, so in this case, the ring is here, all right, because they end up with, being on a ring, they have a, 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 a component of their velocity along the magnetic field, this is the magnetic field direction, and then they have this gyrating ring, okay, so they're, they're uh, you know, they're moving along the field, but then they have this gyrating ring, okay. The gy of course, the gyro uh, uh, period, of course, depends on the ion species. Okay, but anyway, as far as so, so they will want to scatter. You know, there's fluctuations everywhere in these alpha N waves, and so when they scatter, they uh, they either scatter off waves going this way or this way, or some combination, right? They, you know, they just it's a stochastic process. But you just notice the distinction here is that they want to scatter um, onto a sphere. Uh, well, actually, let's do, look at it this way: they they want to scatter on to um, uh, either onto this surface, okay, because they want they would in this plane, right? They remember on a ring now, okay. They would scatter um, uh, about either about these waves, in which case they would go to the the dashed curve, and of course lose energy, and that energy, as I say, gets picked up by the um, by the by the waves, or 
onto this one, in which case they gain energy, and that energy must be taken from the waves. Okay, and then they simply um, and so the but of course if they're if the energy is being taken. Uh, from the waves, say in this case, th then there won't be as many waves here to scatter them, and then they'll tend to go scatter more off these waves over here. So what this tends to, if they, you have enough intensity of pickup ions, they tend to, uh, each part of the distribution tends to scatter off the waves going in the direction such that uh, they minimize the energy of the, the pickup ions. So these guys will scatter this way, and these guys will scatter on the dotted and in the process, you can see you, you've lost a fair amount of energy to the waves. And those waves will be excited by that appropriate amount. OK. All right, so um, what happens? There's a, there's a theory, quasi-linear theory in plasma physics. For those of you who maybe have, have done some plasma physics, where you can kind of go through and actually watch this process going on as from time t equals 0, let's say, if you put particles in to uh, time t infinity, when you get to this sort of quasi-linear plateau, you've probably heard of that concept if you've done plasma physics, which is this final distribution. Anyway, you can calculate the amount of energy. And actually, the calculation I presented was do this as a function of particles picked up at different radii, and then sum them all together, and ask what the final um, energy input to the solar wind would be, and this is what I got. And you can see that it's, you know, it's, it's sort of substantial at 7.5 AU. Um, it, it's, it's focused here on kind of the, uh, this is the um, wave, uh, this is the cyclotron frequency, as would be seen in the solar wind, uh, in the inertial frame, by the spacecraft frame. And there, it's centered near there. It shifts because, of course, uh, as you move out, and I'm adding from different lo radial locations, the properties have changed a little, so the, it's, but it's it's near that position. Okay, this is it further in. Okay, and so you say, oh, you've got all this extra energy input into the solar wind, and um, what happened? So this paper, uh, and the reason I'm actually thinking about this paper now is I wrote this with winging it 30 years ago, and it was I don't know I don't think we we were actually inspired by comets. At that time, Wing Ip was a, a, a very enthusiastic about comets. And you know, 1986 was when Giotto uh, went to Comet Halley. That's probably that's ancient history for, for you guys, but it was very, very uh, real for me. And uh, actually, the Americans took a spacecraft they had that was out in the same similar orbit to ACE, and they figured they could scoop the Europeans and the Russians by taking this spacecraft called IC3, International Sun Earth Explorer 3, and send it, send it back by the moon, twist it around the Earth, or whatever. I don't know how they did this, but they were able to encounter a smaller comet called Jacobini Zinner and, uh, before the encounters with Halley. And one of the things that showed up in these um, um, the, the, the measurements of the comets was a huge, uh, incredible, and I'll have a picture, I think I've got a picture, of, of, of wave excitation. Um, by pickup ions of the comet. So pickup ions in the comet case is sun shines on the comet, sublim you, you get sort of water group um, uh, neutrals, H2O, whatever, OH, uh, which get sublimated from the surface in the heat of the sun. And they just kind of leave the comet, which has a very small gravitational field. They just wander out into space. And eventually, they get ionized by, the, by, solar, uh, by solar photons. And they become then pickup ions. Because and they're moving in orbit, you know, with the uh, with the comet, and uh, they do the same assimilation process I'm, I'm mentioning to you here, and you see as a result alphane fluctuations, uh, very dramatic alphane fluctuations. And so, Wingip was familiar with this, and he thought, wow, what about interstellar pickup lines as well? What would you predict? Well, the interesting story, um, the interesting story to this was that there, there was somebody who went out. Finally, a few years later, there was a group that went out and said, wow, we ought to be able to see these waves. Actually, it's a funny story. I'll, I'll be brief here, because it, well, they, they found something like 31 examples, that, and there are three, or three of them that might be these waves at the right frequency. Um, this was uh, Neil Murphy et al. from JPL group. But then, in, I don't know, it didn't go beyond that. And they, but, but they thought, well, gee, why aren't they more, if, if you your prediction seems to think there's all this, this massive power being dumped into the solar wind. Uh, so then it kind of languished. And then 
I think people eventually, the people looking at the evolution of, of turbulence in the solar wind, uh, took a look, started taking a look at this and realizing that this stuff is a big input into the, the turbulent spectrum in the solar wind, but that, of course, you don't see it because it's immediately swept up by this, um, you know, by the turbulent um, cascade. You know, it, it gets transferred down to lower, uh, higher frequencies, and you don't see it located, you know, near the, near the uh, gyro frequency of the, of, of, the, of the protons. And so, but its energy is still being pumped into the solar wind. And um, so that was, that was kind of the way. In fact, in fact, one of the things that I kind of came out of uh, talking to people, in, in, I actually gave a talk at, at Wing Yip's 70th birthday symposium two weeks ago in, ta in Taiwan. And uh, I kind of looked into this a little bit. I hadn't really followed this whole story. And uh, it turned out there's, uh, um, if you go way out, this is out near, uh, oh gosh, I don't have a scale on this. This is at around 30 AU, Voyager measurements of the um, proton temperatures in the solar wind. You sort of get this upturn. And the claim is that, from my colleagues who've worked on this, is that the extra input, and of course, as you go further out in the solar wind, because the pickup ions have more effect, the extra in input of power into the wind that you can account for this turn up in the Voyager measurements of the proton temperatures. So, so apparently the power is there, but it just gets incorporated into the turbulent cascade, and you don't see it as an individual frequency, which is actually not too surprising. Um, they did some, but then Chuck Smith, who has the magnetometer on ACE, has felt this was an ideal problem for undergraduates and graduates at UNH. And he has looked at a bunch of data sets and done a very, very careful study and many data sets. And actually, students have written these papers. And they found, say, I think the, the, the count was something like 500. This is now in the inner heliosphere. 500 cases where they can make the case that, um, that they're seeing these waves. And, uh, uh, Usually, you only see them, first of all, you see them more likely when the field is radial. And it turns out when the field's radial, the amount of power that goes into the particles when they're picked up is, uh, through this process is greater. Uh, and also, you, they see them when the overall turbulence level in the solar wind is lower, so that the, the cascade is not as efficient at dispersing all this power. So, it, it, was, it was very thrilling for us to see that years, 30 years later, uh, these papers, you can see 2014 and stuff, uh, had really had a, had a substantial impact. So you never, you never know, I mean, what, what you'll work on. Uh, I mean, I did it kind of as a, as a fun plasma physics project, to be honest. I didn't know that much about um, pickup ions at the time. Oh, yeah, so this is the case of pickup ion produced waves at this comet Jacobini Zinner. The one I said that the, the US sent a spacecraft out, the old IC3 uh, a spacecraft out to, and it was called, oh god, it was, what was it called? Renamed it. Uh, anyway, uh, and to, to fly, fly past Jacobini Zinner. And here, what you see, actually this is pretty amazing. So what you see are these incredible wiggles. This is the, this is the magnetic, the lobes of the comet. They flew very close to this thing, the in close. And then there's this big um, region out here where these, um, there's so many of these pickup ions being picked up. And they're mass loading and momentum loading, energy loading the wind so much so that it goes subsonic. And you get a shock transition here, a bow wave on either side. And all these wiggles here are waves which have been generated by this process. I mentioned to you, and what's interesting about this, if and maybe I'm I'm pushing my I'm probably, uh, you know I'm probably a little wishful thinking. I think it's true. If you look at the power spectrum, you'll see this. The dominant time uh, frequency here is like a period of two, like an hour. Uh, this is two hours here. I think I figured this was like a couple of minutes. That's why I put a box around it. And two minutes, if you work it out. Uh, what species, singly ionized, these are all singly ionized, of course, because they only lose one um, uh, electron. Um, the, uh, it turns out that the mass you in infer from this is exactly the mass of a uh, water group, some 16 or 17 
So you can see immediately that the pickup ions that are here are pickup water groups. Um, there is some stuff from hydrogen, but of course hydrogen has much less energy density associated with it, so you don't, you don't see that so much. But the dominant con contribution here in uh, comets is this um, pickup excited waves by water group ions. Yeah, I, was, I just, this is, oh, 120 seconds, yeah. Yes, uh, the, actually, the, from this little analysis going through, uh, this is the cyclotron resonance condition, by the way. Um, we'll come back to this, actually, a little more detail tomorrow, or no, this afternoon. But this is the cyclotron resonance condition, which dictates whether you have a strong interaction between an alphane wave and an ion, and, the, and it's the condition that basically the ion moves through the wave one wavelength and one gyro period. So it keeps seeing the same kind of phase of the, uh, of the electric fields. Um, OK, and here's and the spacecraft fre frequencies here. And you look at the spacecraft frequency, and sure enough, you infer. You know the magnetic field strength is measured, and you get infer the mass of the, the uh, ion responsible. OK. OK. Um, let me talk a little bit about um, shock waves. Um, OK. Um, and again, this is another, uh, another aspect. How was my time doing? OK. This is another aspect of, of heating that takes place in the solar wind. It's not the distribution functions, electrons, um, turbulent cascade. But whenever you have a supersonic flow, and you guys probably, probably know this, I, um, you know, it's, it, you get shock waves all over the place. Almost whatever you try to do to the solar wind, it, it shocks. And particularly, if you run it into a planet, you get a shock wave, of course, because the, planet, the, the solar wind cannot flow through Earth's magnetosphere, for example. And if it's going, and the Mach number of the solar wind at Earth is about maybe anything 5 to 10, something like that. It, it basically is forced to shock, put a, put a bow shock around the Earth, and then it flows. That enables it to deflect the flow and you go around the sides. So that happens at every planet. Um, you also get um, shock waves coming out from the sun, uh, uh, you know, driven by chromal mass ejections. You guys are probably, I'm sure, all familiar with that. And they, we get some pretty large shocks going by. Um, and I'll come back to shocks a lot uh, this afternoon. But uh, you get a lot of um, uh, big shocks coming past uh, many spacecraft in the solar wind. Uh, you also get shocks when you have um, what are called interaction regions where into one direction of space, you may first have the sun emitting slow wind, but then as the sun rotates, it start, a part of the sun which is emitting fast wind sends into that same direction in space, fast wind. And of course, the fast wind overtakes the slow wind, squeezes up against it, and um, I have some pictures uh, of this later. But you know, when you get, you get shocks that kind of force the fluid to heat up in between and send shock waves out. So you get shocks everywhere. And of course, at the end of the heliosphere, we're, there's another big one there. So um, anyway, uh, shocks obviously heat the solar wind. Um, and actually, when I, I know when I've talked to students, um, somehow shocks, and maybe this is lowbrow for you guys, but. Um, I have to say, shock waves are something I, you, don't, you don't have in your daily life a whole lot of experience of. You know, After all, the sound speed's what, 700 miles an hour or something like that. And so you, know, you might occasionally have heard a, a sonic boom by a, but that's a pretty weak shock wave that comes by when a plane breaks the sound barrier. And you get the trailing edge of this thing. Uh, it's a very weak shock, but it all comes you know, power at once. And it's pretty a big boom. Um, otherwise, you don't get shock waves in, in our experience. Uh, bomb blasts, of course, were an unfortunate source of fairly large shock waves. Uh, fortunately, most of us have not experienced that. Um, but anyway, um, so but one, one way often is, is fun to think about shocks is to look at a different medium or different case to get a feel for what they, and this will be just hopefully a little entertaining. But often what I show students is I take the case of surface water waves, OK? And um, it turns out, and, this, and of course you're all familiar with surface water waves, if you go to the beach, you find all these little ripples that come in. Okay, And that's uh, due to the fact that surface water waves in water, their speed depends on the depth of the water. It's v, the space speed squared is, the, is uh, gh, the depth of the water times g. And so the, the deeper the water, the faster the wave. And then 
So what happens is as the water comes in, the deeper water kind of sends a disturbance faster and overtakes the, the shallower water ahead as the, as, as the water comes in after, let's say, as, as the tide comes in or even after just as the ebb and flow of the water. And you, and you, get, and you get the fractured r array of little ripples everywhere. And those are, are little shock waves, basically. And um, I think it gives you a good, it's a two-dimensional problem rather than a three-dimensional problem that we have out in the solar wind. But I think it can give you a kind of a feel for these things. Let me just show you. I, I, I was, I've always been fascinated by this, um, partly because um, we live near the Bay of Fundy, where we have the, t the largest tidal difference in water height in the world. This is the bay that's in between Nova Scotia and the main New Brunswick coast. And I think they get like th over 30 foot differences between high and low tide. And so when each new tide comes in, of course, the deeper water is coming in if, as you're approaching higher tide. And uh, that sends uh, a surface water wave up like this. And uh, it, you know, it, it kind of goes up rivers. This is it, it coming at the end of a bay, you know, and goes up a river like this. And one other interesting thing, because of all this tidal flow, um, the amount of, you know, the, the soil at the bottom of, of these uh, rivers and, and bays just gets totally turbulent, because it's an incredible sweep of water replacement of water every 12 hours. And I've even actually flown over the Bay of Fundy by airplane, and you can see how red the whole bay is, just because of all this turbulent action. So there's a, there's a little shock wave moving up. And you can see its speed is faster here and slower here. And of course, that's because the depth of the water is different here and there and so forth. So uh, you, you, know, you can get a feel for how complex fronts can form. And you can see also, by the way, like a shock wave, as you know, you get turbulence behind, right? So you have laminar flow ahead, turbulence behind, just as you'd expect in a, in a shock in, 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 say, the atmosphere or something like that. Um, OK. And a fun part of this is that, and I, this, is, this is just entertaining, I hope. Um, uh, it turns out one of the things you can do in the Bay of Fundy is um, they have little outfits that will take you out in a dinghy like this. Okay. And they say, OK, we're going to go out and, and you know, visit the, the tidal bore, as it's, is what it's called, as it comes in. And so we did this. And actually, it was an amazing experience. I'll try to be brief here, because I can make a long story out of this. But um, it starts out, you, they, they, you have to wait until it comes in. They know when it's more or less going to come. And you know, you, they put wetsuits on, OK, and all that. And then you, you, you finally go out, and they say, oh, they see it. It's out there, OK. So you go out, and you don't see much. And suddenly, this little ripple about this tall sky, you know, this little ripple like this, you say, what, what do we have wetsuits for? This is ridiculous. And, um, but of course, what happens in this particular bay right, is it narrows down as you come in. And as it narrows down, of course, the amount of water, and this thing rises. And you start, it gets to a point where it's maybe like three feet high. And they kind of go back and forth over it, OK? And you, know, you still don't get very wet. But then what happens is you enter, there's a river that comes into this bay at the end, which is empty at low tide, of course. And so you can't go, when the tidal bore gets that far, you can't go over the tidal bore because there's no water to go into. What happens is, so you think, ah, the fun's over, huh? So this, then this tidal bore goes, goes on up this stream, or this river, filling up the river. But then what's amazing is you have this incredible fast flow of water going down this river. And what it do happens is if you have profiles of, um, like, you know, any bo river bottom would have, you know, humps and various structures, you set up, um, if you set up a resonance with the surface water wave by, a, say, a certain size, uh, you know, object on the surface as um, profile, you get standing waves uh, that are generated where they're essentially propping against the flow at exactly the speed of the flow, and you get and they can they rise up to like six feet from or seven feet from trough to crest, and then of course they, the, these guys know where these are going to appear because you have to satisfy the resonance condition, the height of the river, and so you get a wicked you know cascade of of, of fronts at one position, and then it goes away because you don't satisfy the residence condition. And then you, they know where another one's going to appear, and they take you over there. And of course, everyone gets soaked. And um, it's a lot of fun. So I, would, I definitely recommend um, going to the Bay of Fundy if you ever want a real, real fun. Um, and you can even rationalize going there because it's great physics. OK. Uh, yeah. And of course, um, these surface waterways can get huge and very dangerous, of course. And this is a picture of the Japan tsunami of 2011. And actually, I was in Japan up till about a month, uh, half, uh, about a month before this.
So it was really kind of a, a huge tragedy. But uh, again, it's um, it, so shock waves can also be even surface water waves can be pretty dramatic. Okay. Okay. Um, let me. Um, so you can also create a lot of waves um, uh, uh, by these shocks. Um, they create turbulence, and I'll, I'll get into more, much more of this um, uh, this afternoon when we talk about particle acceleration at shock waves. But just to give you a feel of this, we're talking about shock heating and so forth of the solar wind. I mean, it, it's very typical. This is a traveling shock, a very well-studied one. And uh, you see if you go upstream or downstream, actually, upstream for some distance upstream of the shock, you get some in very impressive enhancements. Not so, not so much in the um, magnitude of B, but in the three components. So these are transverse waves, alphane waves, basically, or magnetosonic. Uh, you know, large amplitude waves in both upstream and downstream, which obviously uh, dump certain amounts of energy into the turbulent cascade. Um, oh, yeah, this is a picture of, of the kind of uh, shock wave you get uh, when a fast stream from the solar wind. Here's the rotating sun. And I, I mentioned to you, right, suppose in this direction of space, you had slow wind up here, but the sun's rotated like this, and it sends fast, w wind, into, uh, f um, fast wind into that same region of space. But depending on the, you know, depending on sort of the pattern of, of so uh, beforehand, it's slow, slow wind's being put out over here, fast wind over here with some line dividing the two kinds of wind, that geometry determines the orientation of these shocks that eventually form when fast wind then tries to run into the slow wind. And if there's a, a slope here that's a little bit slighter, it's not straight up, uh, the fast wind can slide over the, um, over the slow wind. Um, of course, it, it, you don't get as strong a shock then, of course, but you can get these kinds of, all these kinds of complicated geometries that come out of, um, out of the co you know, these, uh, because of the sun's rotation. I remember I, I, I attended a, a workshop on CIRs, co-rotating reaction regions, and, you know, I always, I feel that a lot of questions came up, it was very interesting, but I, I realized that the stumbling block for most of us was just geometry. You had to think three-dimensionally about trying to get, and that's what actually got me to actually write a paper on the sort of morphology of CIRs, because otherwise it's very hard to, to really proceed if you haven't mastered the geometry. Okay, let me just go to, how are we doing? Okay, I think we're in, we're in good shape. Let me go to the termination of the solar wind. And, you know, this is a tremendous, I don't know if you guys have followed the Voyager measurements, uh, but I notice, um, but I thought it's, it's such, a, such a, an adventure and uh, discovery that I thought I should just go over it briefly. Um, uh, it's, it's a story, of course, of the end of the heliosphere. You know, we, we, we live in this domain of the wind, but the wind can't go on forever because it keeps running out of ram pressure, and eventually it has to stop. Um, Parker realized that, and there was a, there's a nice figure of, of the heliosphere uh, in his 1963 book. Anyway, so what, uh, there's some interesting, uh, so, and of course, it ends in a shock wave because, again, it's still, even though because of pickup ions, the, sound, the Mach number of the solar wind is reduced, it's still supersonic or super, you know, fast magnetosonic, or whatever you want to place it. And so you get a shock wave. It's not a strong shock. The Mach number is, as they say, maybe only three. I think three, 3.5 was when they finally observed a, a shock at about um, 90, 95 astronomical units. Uh, you know, the Mach number at, at Earth is like eight, something like that. So this is a much less dramatic supersonic flow out there. But still, this was, um, this was a, a Voyager 1 and uh, right here. And uh, this was another. Um, it was interesting, actually, to, uh, the, you know, watching scientists, you know, sort of work trying to figure out what's going on here. Uh, there was a lot of debate about this, too. I mean, people who felt, oh, no, that's not a shock. You know, that's not it, There's, you know, for some reason. And, and partly because in the, I mean, although it's, it seems pretty clear, you know, you've got a lot of fluctuations here, a lot of fluctuations after. It's kind of hard to make sure you're really looking at a transition 
And, and of course, Voyager 1 doesn't have a plasma instrument, so um, field. And so, um, you know, you don't, you don't know, you don't really see the, the increase in the plasma density in, on Voyager 1. Um, uh, Voyager 2 was different because it has a plasma instrument. In this case, uh, you, could, you could actually see, again, not a very strong shock. Here's the velocity going down to the subsonic flow afterwards. Various temperature, number density kind of goes up, but it's a little, it's not, you know, but it's uh, actually this, this feature, the fact that uh, in front of the shock, you're getting a slowdown in the solar wind, is due to, it's a precursor, which is due to the energy, um, pressure gradient of energetic particles produced by the shock. Um, and their pressure gradient is such as to slow down the incoming flow. I mean, they're really part of the shock structure. Um, we'll, we'll talk about this a little more later uh, this afternoon, too. Um, let me give my two-dimensional surface uh, water wave uh, analog. You've probably maybe seen this. This was uh, recognized as a nice a analog by many of the termination shock. If you simply take a plate, this is my, my sink, what was my sink before renovation. Anyway, when you run water into a plate, you get nice laminar, looks like it's kind of dirty water in Durham, but anyway. Um, you get nice laminar flow out in all directions on your plate, and then um, you get a shock a transition, which it, its location on the plate, of course, depends on how high the lip of the plate is, of course, which is sort of an art, it's not, a, you know. But anyway, you get, and you see it's turbulent, and this is sort of a nice two-dimensional model of what happens when the solar wind goes out and basically can't, can't push anymore, and it ends in a shock transition, or goes, it goes subsonic across, and then it, it's, in this case, the water's channeled around the sides, uh, and of course, that happens in the uh, solar wind as well. And in fact, here's, uh, as we suspected, and as, actually, this is recent work since been, which has been informed by the, um, by the Voyager measurements, that this is our kind of, uh, at the time it was, this 2008, uh, consistent with what we know. This is what our heliosphere looks like now, and it's, it's actually, I, I, went, I, I didn't, wasn't able to find a picture, uh, uh, you know, Parker's picture of one of his models. It wasn't that different from this, to be honest. Here's the solar wind going out radially. Here's the sun, solar wind. Here's the termination shock. This is plotting colors mean temperature. So at the shock, you get heating. Um, this, is the, this is the helio sheath. This is the shocked, heated solar wind. And then you end up here. And then you get a, um, uh, and then this is the, what's called the, the this, is the, this red region is the helio sheath. It's shocked solar wind plasma, OK? But then. You, you go over into the, um, then the interstellar plasma, okay, which is out here. And I believe, I think this, this one actually has, has the neutral gas in it as well, which modifies the picture a little bit. But anyway, out here, then you, now you're in the interstellar medium gas, but of course it's forced to flow around. The heliopause, which is this boundary between ionized interstellar gas and solar gas. And, um, you get, because, and this is, a, the flow is coming from the right-hand side here, so you get an asymmetry, uh, as Parker anticipated. And um, so, uh, so this is what we kind of expect this thing to look like. And actually, the Voyagers are going out in these two directions, and we have gone substantially further. The Voyager 1 is now outside here. And again, it's been an incredible, exciting, incredibly exciting because, of course, as you can imagine, there's lots of controversy. Lots of people have different opinions. They allow the, you know, it's it's wild. It's uh, and of course you have to wait a long time for things to get resolved. Because oh, by the way, I wanted one of the comment about this. You can see the size scale on this is 2,000, 2,000 uh, AU from here to here. And if you translate that into how much time it takes light to go that distance. It's 10 days or 12 days, I think. So you really, you know, for the most part, by, by so my space studies, I've always still thought that the, the speed of light was kind of infinite. But it isn't. When you think about, this is what we think of as kind of our environment. It takes light 12 days to get across. That's, that's a, big, a big object. 
Oh, yeah, I wanted to come back to this. Um, I want to say one other thing about the termination shock. Um, and that is that, remember, we've got these pickup ions in this ring that's, you remember, and you remember it goes through zero, and it's sent on the solar wind, and, and you know, they, you keep picking them up as you go out. So, and they're totally dominating the solar wind. You know, you've mass loaded, you know, so that they reduce the, there's so many of them that the sound, sp the sound speed's gone way up, because these guys have a thermal speed of the solar wind speed. Uh, so the, uh, you know, I tell you, the, the sound, so, and therefore the Mach number's gone way down. The, the really interesting thing is that these guys, um, because when you get to the termination shock, it's mostly these particles which participate in the heating, in the shock heating. Because usually these perpendicular shocks, which are, the, this is the solar wind magnetic field is really azimuthal at that point. So you end up getting um, uh, a perpendicular shock. So the, the magnetic field is power in the shock plane. And you do you get electric fields which um, uh, reject uh, enough protons, which then scatter off this potential, go back into a gyration like this, and basically produce a heated component of ions downstream, which provides the, the you know, satisfies the Rankine-Yagonia relation in this ship. Well, it turns out that these particles, because they're out, because of their distribution, all these particles in here, uh, this is the shock potential. They, this not this part of the distribution. They go straight on in, through the shock. But these guys get reflected, and there's enough of them that when you reflect all of these particles, you get a huge amount of shock heating, not sort of by heating so, but just by you know you know sh pouncing particles off. They ride up the shock and come in with a much higher energy than they would have had, and that's sufficient to satisfy, for this fairly weak shock, the rankine yagonia relationships. And so it turns out that the pressure in this heliosheath area, this vast heliosheath area, is dominated by these pickup ions, which is sort of incredible when you think about it. I mean, it's, you know, one AU of these things are kind of a small sideshow, but when you get out into the distant heliosphere, they're, they're the biggest part of the story. Um, OK. Um, oh, yeah. Let me just take a couple more minutes. This is the, the really impressive. So the Voyager, Voyager 1 went out. It went through this heliosheath region, uh, which was very um, kind of kind of quiescent. Um, you know, it would have, um, and then this is the region that's dominated by, um, and finally, in 2000, you guys probably heard about this, but finally in 2012, Suddenly, you know, there were huge amounts of, you know, these various energetic particles in different channels. Uh, this was uh, accelerated pickup ions uh, called the anomalous component. We'll get, we'll get into that this afternoon. But um, there are, you know, a bunch of particles, some accelerated, uh, most of them accelerated at the um, nation shock. And they, and suddenly, they drop through like three orders of magnitude um, at this location. And, um, this was, well, not everyone agreed on this, which I, it was kind of incredible. I, I, I remember we were, um, I remember when this happened, we were about to have a meeting of the of Voyager investigators, and I, which I actually went to. And it was, it was first called the Helio Cliff because some people didn't want to admit that this was the Helio pause, right? The division between interstellar medium for the first time. Voyager going into the interstellar medium and inside what we would call the heliosphere. And of course, that's a huge transition. We've never, I mean, couldn't have dreamt of leaving the heliosphere before Voyager anyway. And Voyager's still functioning. And so uh, I think, you know, and people had theories of, well, no, 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 we're, we're in some other transition. Notice there were, presumably, the boundary kind of moved back and forth across the spacecraft a couple times here. Uh, and then, of course, so it wasn't totally clear cut, but this huge drop happened. And sure enough, the galactic cosmic rays went up to their level that you'd expect in interstellar space. And this is the first time, of course, we'd ever seen these low energy galactic cosmic rays because they, and we'll talk about this this afternoon, they get, they get, um, you know, they're not, they don't get in, you know, they against these flows. And so, um, so this is, and, and knowing the energy spectrum of cosmic rays down there was just something incredible. 
Uh, and notice all these particles associated with the heliosphere, they just drops to zero. There's a little bit of leakage here. Um, and so after lots of debate, and, and even now I have a feeling that uh, there are people who don't want to believe it. So, uh, uh, oh yeah, oh, the magnetic, but of course I'm always confused by the magnetic field. The magnetic field is, the instrument is really being taxed. You have to remember the voyages were designed to go to the outer planets. They were never designed for this. And so some of the instruments, but the incredible thing is that they, the amount we've learned from them. But the magnetometer is pretty, is pretty, is being uh, uh, taxed. But anyway, and, and, but, but in the, this is the magnetic field measurement. And, but sure enough, it did see, basically, um, let's see. These are the particles, right? So here's the magnetic field, OK? So it went through, it goes through all this. You know, and, and you know, I think there's big error bars on this, so you got to be careful. But they, it did see these places where we presumably, the boundary crossed over us and then back. So we, this is interstellar field out here, presumably. And then this is she helio sheath field. Not that different, actually, as you can see. Um, but the, the tricky part was, and, and I, I I think because this was so hard measurement to make, uh, the, the initial result I heard from the magnetometer people was that the, solar, the magnetic field out there had the same direction as the heliospheric field. You know, what? <laughs> and that was sort of inconceivable uh, that, it would, that it, that would happen. And, and people had estimates. We have estimates on what the field ought to be by s symmetry of the heliosphere and stuff. So there were huge debates about this. And of course, huge pressure put on the magnetometer people. And eventually now, the, I think things have, have come to terms with that. And, and now I think that basically the magnetic field is in a direction that is consistent, and I won't have time to get into that, with what we would have expected from uh, asymmetries. Right? You can imagine a heliosphere, if you change the direction of the field, you get certain asymmetries in the heliosphere. And from those as observed asymmetries, you can tell a little bit of something about what plane the interstellar magnetic field has to reside in. And so I think right now it's, it's approaching, as Voyager goes out, um, it's approaching those, that direction. So I think, from my uninvolved point of view, and I don't have any stake in this. <laughs> Other people probably have more of a stake. You know, so. um, right. So um, yeah, I was going to say, it has to do with alignment. I won't, I won't go into that. Oh, oh yeah, let me just say one more thing, because this is really interesting. I, I thought, oh, you guys would like this. Because we, we ended the solar wind at back at 100 AU, OK? All right. OK, it's gone. Solar wind's gone. But wait, no. The termination of the neutral solar wind. You remember I said that when you pick up a, a pickup ion, you get a, a neutral solar wind flowing outwards, right? That's got, it's neutral, and it just keeps going. It leaves the heliosphere. And who knows? OK, where it went, OK? Eventually, of course, it's going to hit something or get ionized or something. But get this, and I'll, do, I'll be quick on this, but um, the IBEX mission, probably, oh, you maybe have heard about this. One of the big surprises of the, of the IBEX mission was this neutral particles, these kind of energies. You get this ring structure. And after a lot of, a lot of suggested theories, and et cetera, et cetera, it was recognized that this ring is perpendicular to the presumed uh, direction of the interstellar magnetic field. And the, the best, I think, the correct theory on what creates this, and this is pretty incredible, is that the neutral solar wind goes out, leaves the, helio, the whole heliosphere, and it goes out, and eventually it charge exchanges. So it, it, it gives up its electron to a, um, a charged particle out there. And there's no it then has to gyrate about the magnetic field out there. It's in gyrates. And if it doesn't scatter much, this is the, the rub. If it gyrates like this, and then it gets, now it needs another charge exchange. And if it does that, it will leave, it will be in its phase of gyration such that it will end up somewhere going into a plane, somewhere in that direction. Part of that circle would allow it to go directly back from the direction it came in, back towards the sun. And, and you can see that it, but it could be in any, any, you know, any direction like this. And um, that's the, uh, the argument for what the, the, the. So interestingly, it's, the ribbon is a story of three 
three charge exchanges, the original one by a pickup ion, which produced a pickup ion in the inner heliosphere, neutral, uh, neutral, hyd you know, neutral solar wind proton, uh, uh, hydrogen, goes out, gets ionized again, goes into a gyration about the interstellar magnetic field, and then it gets ionized again, comes in. And of course, it could go off. I mean, it could go. Let's see. I mean, it could go off in uh, in any direction. Of course, I'm using because the solar wind's going in all directions, right? So that's why it gives you the ribbon, yeah, you because know, you have something like that. That that could happen in any dire any direction like this. Okay. So so that that really is the end of the solar wind. After a small adventure out in interstellar space, and came come, came coming back to reveal itself in the ibex ribbon, which is kind of incredible, I think. But and again. I think most people agree on that now. It's the only explanation which re has really, oh yeah, this is a diagram, I think, where I try to show what, what's happening there. You know, now, a charge exchange here goes into a gyration about that, but it could be in any direction, okay? And then if it, it doesn't scatter, it can't scatter. And a lot of debates now about why, does, why don't these pick up ions scatter like they do in the solar wind. And I think the reason that is given is that the interstellar medium is incredibly quiet in the relevant frequency range to scatter these particles. They just sit there and gyrate, and then they happen to come, they come back. OK, I think that's it. Yeah. OK, thanks. And sorry I went over a little bit here. Uh, and we will continue with a slightly different uh, angle into particle acceleration. And at uh, 1.30, I guess. <laughs>